um, because of an issue in my own neighborhood. And it's really raised my interest level in contributing to um, the planning part of the county. Um, I work for the Oregon State Bar. I'm a licensed attorney. And I found this would be a really good way to use my law expertise and give back to the community. I realize I didn't say where I live in the county. I live in um, Helvetia area, about a mile north of Highway 26, and I've lived there 30 years. So may we have the director's report? Oh, two members online. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Um, Commissioner Mori Bidu, would you go next? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm Rachel Mori Bidu. I um, I'm still muted. Am I still muted? Can you hear me now? Uh, can you go ahead and try again? Can you hear me? I hear you, uh, Rachel. Mark, was there anything that we needed to do or? I hear you, Rachel. Can you hear me, Rachel? I can hear you. Can they hear you? I don't know. Can you guys hear me? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Good to see you again after a long hiatus, Rachel. No, thank you, too. Um, Morgan and Rachel, we can't hear you yet, so hold on a second. I'm glad we hear each other. We know it's not <laughs> our, our end. It looks like exactly. their end. That's what I was thinking, too. I wonder if they can hear each other. We can. Big nods. <laughs> oh, you can hear each other, but not. We can't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not going to I'll, I'll say something every few minutes so you can keep testing them. See if you hear us in the chamber there. Just testing our audio again. Yeah, okay. is it working? Well, they, they are. Yeah, they can hear us. They can hear each other. Oh. Yeah, that's right. No, it's still not working. So, Rachel, are you watering your plants regularly? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> In my starkly white room. <laughs> yeah, I've got to get some new glasses. You know, everything's all blurry. <laughs> I have really bad lighting, so it's just blurry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay, it looks like they're working on it. Yeah. Well, I wish, I thought there was a chat feature, but I guess not. Yeah, I think oh, you're... Oh, we can hear him back there. That's the start. Oh, can you hear can us you now? Hear Maybe you just need to turn up the microphone. Pump up the volume. I've had that happen to me before where it, it, everything's working fine. Just have the microphone on really low or mute or something. Or the, the speaker is on low or mute. Yeah. yeah. That's not good. Still not working. <laughs> Snack break. Well, it looks like they got a quorum without us. One, two, three. Yeah, right. <laughs> they don't even need us today. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I'll, I can text Todd and. I wonder if we should log out and log back in. Is that going to help? What do you think? Probably not. I'll ask. I'll ask Todd. I see if yeah. he's looking at his phone. Lots of. So, Deborah, we could do the director's report now and then test introductions again when we're done with that. They can hear you. Is that right? I, I think they can hear us. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, okay. Let's, Commissioner let's, Badu and Commissioner Will will go ahead with the director's report. Please. Okay. Good evening. My name is Erin Wardell. I'm the Planning and Development Services Manager here at Washington County. And for the Planning Commission, I have the delegated authority of the director from our actual director, Stephen Roberts, who is here this evening and is going to welcome you. Yeah. Well, good evening, everybody. I just wanted to stop and say hello and welcome our new members and say hello to our returning members. Thank you all for your service on the commission. We really do appreciate you. And um, 
I'm going to just hang out tonight. I understand you're going to have some training from, from Rob and um, there are a couple of other projects I'm interested in just getting updated on myself. So I'll just be around listening in. But again, just want to thank you all for being here and thank you for your service. Thank you, Stephen. So on to the director's report. So a lot has happened since your last meeting in December, including our three new planning commissioners appointments, which the board did actually Tuesday for Jared yesterday. So he slid in here at the last minute, worked out great timing wise. Um, and then commissioners um, McClendon and Monteblanco were appointed in January. So welcome to our new members. We will have a recognition event for our outgoing planning commissioners as well. We're looking at scheduling that probably in March because one of them has been traveling. So when they're all available, we'll schedule that maybe before one of our upcoming evening meetings. So we have a chance to recognize them and have some snacks and reward them with some plaques. Um, at this meeting this evening, the county rules do state that the planning commission should elect and install a chair and a vice chair. So we're recommending that Chair Lockwood address that at the end of tonight's meeting. And I think that's the plan. So to give you an update on a couple of ordinances that the Planning Commission heard a while back, um, on January 16th, the board considered ordinance number 897, and that was the ordinance relating to the Metro Urban Growth Boundary expansion for River Terrace 2.0, an expansion of the city of Tigard. The board decided to continue that hearing to November 19th, 2024. The purpose of the continuance is to allow us to finish our update of our significant natural resources regulations before we make the plan amendment change for that. And then the other ordinance update is on B engrossed ordinance number 882. That is the ordinance that amended the transportation system plan relating to an extension of Tile Flat Road. The board did adopt that ordinance on January 30th. For today's PC meeting, we have a couple of work session items. We'll have a public officials ethics training from Rob Bovet. We'll also have an update on the Washington County Transit Study and hold a hearing on ordinance number 900, which proposes amendments to the county's transportation system plan. For your upcoming meetings, on March 6th, we have a day meeting. We um, right now are holding that for a possible second hearing on Ordinance 900 in case you determine that you need more time on that ordinance, you could choose to continue it to March 6th. We also could hold a work session or a PC training if there's something that we can address at that meeting for you. And then on March 20th in the evening, we don't have any work sessions or trainings planned, but we could schedule that. We will also likely have work sessions on some updates to our parking regulations, which are required from some recent state rules known as the climate friendly and equitable communities rules. And then we could have a work session on an update on the significant natural resources project as well. And that concludes my director's report. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Wardell? Are we still in the same situation technically? I wonder if we could ask uh, Commissioner Morgan or. Can you hear us now? I can hear you guys. Uh, can you hear us? Speak to us and. Oh, no. no. Yep, still yeah. not We hear each other. Yep. <laughs> Sounds like team's working on it. Well, Mr. Bobet, I do have a question. Um, we didn't do the roll call. Should, yes. Would now be a good time, even though they, they can raise their hand, I guess? Okay. Do we have the roll call, please? Sure. Commissioner Fry. Present. Commissioner McClendon. Present. Commissioner Milliman. Present. Commissioner Mori Bidu. She put her hand up. Yeah. Commissioner Monte Blanco. Present. Commissioner Will. Present. He raised his hand, virtual hand. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Whips. <clears throat> Chair Lockwood. Present. And it looks like we have eight uh, planning commissioners in attendance. Thank you. Is anyone signed up for public communication? No. All right. So we go ahead to um, our work session. First work session is public official ethics. Mr. Bovet. Good evening, everyone. This is Rob Bovet. I'm one of the um, 
uh, county lawyers here with the Office of County Counsel. Uh, we're the civil lawyers for the county. Um, I'm assigned to uh, land use, IT, community corrections, and whatever else my boss wants me to do on any given day. Um, I am here as essentially the lawyer for the planning commission, not any of you individually. And my role is to um, multiple, but mostly to make sure that we uh, follow the correct process in conducting our business on land use matters generally. And I'll talk about the specific two categories of land use matters that generally come before you. I'm also the lawyer in our office that uh, defends your decisions when they get appealed. Um, or defends the Board of Commissioners' decisions uh, when they um, take matters up that you've heard and make recommendations to them. Um, so um, we just have one land use lawyer here, and I'm kind of what you have. Um, I would like to share a few things with you this evening. Uh, I know three of you are, are fairly new, and we um, talked about these before, so some of this will be a little bit of a repeat, but I'm going to do a little deeper dive into um the two types of uh, cases that generally come before you, or two types of matters would be a better way to put it. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about public meetings law, public records law, uh, the two types of, of, of hearings that you have, quasi-judicial and legislative, briefly, um, and then also conflicts of interest and how those all apply. But uh, um, in talking, I just realized that my cheat sheet notes are not in the order I actually want them, so I'm going to go backwards. Uh, I think I'd like to talk about the two types of proceedings and then talk about public meetings law, public records law, and how that those are all implicated by those two types of proceedings. So let's talk first about those two types of proceedings, and they are quasi-judicial land use matters and legislative land use matters. And the way I've always generally described the difference for both lay folks and for folks that are generally involved in land use is for your purposes as planning commissioners, you have to render decisions on both types of matters, but there are different rules and procedures that apply to both. And we'll get into explaining why there are different rules and procedures. But as an overall perception matter, if you have a quasi-judicial matter that comes before you, it's generally a smaller matter in terms of how much land we're talking about. It usually affects a smaller number of people there are, as a result, heightened due process, and I'll talk about all that. We have more requirements to follow. And if you envision yourself, for those of you who are familiar with our justice system, as a judge, in quasi-judicial matters, you're wearing really a judicial type hat. You're deciding a case that is presented to you by the parties, sometimes opposing parties, almost as if you're sitting as nine judges or seven judges in a courtroom. And for that reason, I need to make sure we follow the rules that judges generally follow. Things like no ex parte contact, disclosure of biases, making sure we declare conflicts of interest, not engage in things, and probably uniquely important, ex parte contacts. That means that parties really shouldn't be communicating with you about their case outside of what you actually hear in this room or in the big hearing room before in the big hearing room that's the same rule for judges basically you can't have one side of a case going talking to a judge you know after hours or calling or whatever that's not allowed in judicial proceedings to ensure that everybody is treated fairly and then they have an unbiased decision maker so we need to ensure you're unbiased if i had my druthers i'd seal you on a hermetically sealed bag on every qj or quasi-judicial hearing that came before you. And that's really what we're striving for, to ensure that you are that neutral and impartial and detached decision maker on a case. Think of yourselves like a judge. The other matter is legislative. And um, for this planning commission and how our land use planning system works, those are more common. You have a legislative matter coming before you uh, a little later in the form of an ordinance. Those are generally code amendments that are broad spectrum, don't apply just to subset of people where you're rezoning or doing something like that. It applies across the board, um, if not countywide, to all the zones. So it's not particular individualized property owners. We're talking about really policy level decisions. And if you could think of yourselves in legislative hearings more like a legislator, you'll actually, a lot of it will flow naturally from that. The conflict of interest rules still apply, but many of the other rules don't because it's not a matter of one party 
by urging you to do something so their property is benefited or not. It's across the board, likely affecting thousands and thousands of potential property owners. Um, and so there are those are the two types of matters that come before you. But before I get into some of the detailed rules that apply to each of those, we need to talk about some of the basic rules around public meetings law, around public records law, and public ethics law. Because for better or for worse, you are all public officials on a public body subject to all of those laws because the Planning Commission is, in fact, a public body subject to all of those laws. So let's talk real quickly about uh, public meetings law. Um, and our basic structure of our public meetings law has remained the same really since 1973, right on the heels of Watergate is when we first adopted. This is a sunshine law. And in Oregon, basically all public meetings need to be open to the public. The public needs to be able to, to observe what its public bodies are doing. And that's what we're doing here today. This is a public meeting. In fact, we record it and we post it online. So pretty much anybody can watch it at any time. And we need to ensure that your public meetings remain public meetings and observable by the public. And what I mean by that is um, anything taken outside of the context of the public meeting that can form a public meeting needs to be observable by the public. Let me give you a couple examples of where we can easily go wrong and you'll find me guarding these things very carefully because mistakes have been made, um, generally not in this county, but in other counties that were made nameless. Um, one uh, example uh, that we see is a common violation of public meetings laws, what we call uh, serial communications. Another is communications through an intermediary. And let me give you an example of how both of those work. Um, the public meetings law basically says that among you, a quorum of you cannot get together to talk about anything that comes before you because a quorum of you could actually deliberate and decide something. So all that has to be open, viewable to the public. Let's just say, hypothetically, you engage in an email chain talking about something that comes before you. One goes to the second, goes to the third. Now we've got four or five. We've got a quorum, and you're all talking about something that's going to come before you. That email chain, that serial email chain, is technically a public meeting. And guess what? It's in violation of the public meetings law. There are potential remedies such as voiding decisions and all kinds of other things that I won't get into. But I don't want to have to try to defend that because I can't legally. So I will very carefully watch any email exchanges among and between planning commissioners. And I would encourage you not to really engage in that on any matter that is coming before you or might come before you. I, I don't care about whether you're having lunch together or things like that, but if, if it involves an ordinance or a quasi-judicial land use matter, really you need to stay away from communicating on the substance of that matter by email. Another example is um, creating a public meeting um, by intermediary. And I'll just give you, well, I'll give you the actual facts of the case that developed this case law out of another county, not this county, um, where um, an administrator decided um, he, he needed to know what his particular board of five people were going to do with a particular hot topic. And he decided to go talk to each of the commissioners in that case. And that's fine. Um, and he can find out where each is at. Where he made his mistake is when he went to Commissioner 1, he found out what Commissioner 1 wanted. And then he went to Commissioner 2. He said, what do you think? Oh, and by the way, this is what Commissioner 1 thinks. And then he did that to all five. And the problem is, essentially, he was conducting deliberations as an intermediary. If he had just received information from each commissioner, he would have been okay, but he's essentially conducting a public meeting without notice, and it's all in his head. That's a violation of public meetings law, and I can't defend it. So also don't use an intermediary to communicate with each other about a matter of substance that comes before you. Those are the two biggest errors I see in public bodies under our public meetings law. So bottom line, everything needs to be out in the open, sunshine, everybody gets to observe everything. That's uh, the essence of what I want to uh, communicate to you about public meetings law. Let me talk a bit about public records law, which um, I normally wouldn't talk about now, but I have reasons for wanting to talk about it a lot. Uh, public records law also applies to all of our communications 
related to the planning commission or related to land use planning. So clearly all of the emails that we send from our email accounts are all public records. Whether they're disclosable or not is a different question, but they're all public records. Believe it or not, all of the emails you send to and from land use or each other about planning commission business are also public records, even if you're using your own personal email account. I mentioned this to the three newbies um, yesterday, but if you do want to keep separations, sometimes it's nice to have a separate email address for just this business because we can get a public records request for emails among and between planning commissioners, say covering a week period over whatever topic. And I will be asking you to produce those emails to the extent there's any communications between commissioners that we're not aware of. Now, if you have commission, if you have communications and your only communications are with staff, we have those, of course, because those are all part of our system. But I just want to flag you to the fact that if you're conducting planning commission business as a planning commissioner, even using your personal email, those are public records. I'll also just briefly mention, uh, I should mention this, texting is the pain of my county lawyer existence for the last 20 or 30 years, because these things aren't saved, generally speaking. Um, there are programs that can save some of these things, and some county employees have that, that really need to have the texting function. But generally, I discourage you from doing any text messages about any public business anytime ever. Um, otherwise, I might have to <laughs> ask you to borrow your phone and take pictures and snapshots of text messages, assuming they're still there. The other big problem with text messages is public records have to be retained for certain lengths of time based on what their content is. A, a text message that disappears after 30 days because the server doesn't hold it anymore, that doesn't comply with anything. And so it just creates a whole groundswell of challenges. So I did want to mention those uh, those uh, pieces to you about public records because we have recently actually have had a public records request for email, uh, emails and text messages associated with the planning commission actions. So just be aware of that. Um, now let's talk about uh, conflicts of interest and then I'll put all this back into context where I started with quasi judicial hearings and legislative matters. We have here in Oregon, very strong um, uh, government ethics laws. In fact, we were one of the first states to adopt one uh, it's way back in 1908 that we adopted uh, our first state ethics laws. Now, it didn't go into effect for technical reasons I won't bore you with, uh, but they fixed it the very next legislative session. But the whole idea is that people who have a public position, such as yours, even though it's a volunteer position, should not benefit financially or avoid financial detriment just because of your position. So we take the financial incentives out of it. Um, this is uh, originally this was aimed at basically uh, 1908. It was about, all about the railroad spending too much money influencing legislators. Um, and you kind of know where all that goes. And so uh, we have very strong laws that uh, address that issue. Um, I want to talk about two things under ethics laws, and I'll talk real briefly about the Ethics Commission. So the... Um, there are two basic uh, requirements under our state ethics laws with regard to what are called actual and potential conflicts of interest. And there are different rules that apply to each. If you have an actual conflict of interest, that means we know pretty much for certain that there will be financial benefit or avoidance of financial detriment to you or your family or your dependents depending on the action taken on the matter at hand. If you have an actual conflict of interest, which means there will be financial impacts on you or your family or dependents because of a decision on this matter, you are, the state law requires you to, one, announce that you have that conflict. Say, hey, uh, I got a conflict of interest here. Uh, our decision on this is going to benefit me financially or de avoid uh, financial detriment or the other way around. And the second thing the law requires you to do is step down. So you say, I'm not going to participate in the deliberations or decisions on this matter. I always encourage folks that are in that situation, you don't have to, to actually step down from the dais too. And then you can participate, for example, as a citizen. And say, I'm not a planning commissioner here and, and testify in favor or opposed. You just essentially step away. Um, that's for an actual conflict of interest where you know 
um, that there is a potential financial benefit or potential uh, avoidance of financial detriment. And then there are potential conflicts of interest where it's, um, it's speculation, um, not uh, wild speculation, but there's a chance that you could receive some financial benefit here or avoid some financial detriment depending on this decision, but it's not really known for sure. That's a potential conflict of interest. The law requires you to disclose that. I got a potential conflict of interest and here is what it is. The difference is the law doesn't require you to step down. If you have a potential conflict of interest, you may still participate in deliberations and decision-making if you have in fact announced that that potential conflict of interest on the record so everybody knows. And I'll help you with all of those. And I should also say, I'm here to help you navigate any of these if any of these come up. And they often do, uh, especially for those that are maybe developers on the commission or there's some direct connection to your job or your employer or you, you yourself. Um, but there's a second resource, and I gotta say it's even better than me, and it's the planning commission. Um, and I love the planning, my planning commission friends, and I hope they're not offended what I'm going to say next, but they really nerd out on ethics laws. They love to dig into the details of ethics laws. And if it's anything that's even close to gray, I'm probably going to suggest that you call them because then you will get an answer from the people that actually administer the law. And you can utilize that for what it's worth, which is direct evidence from the people that would enforce this law. And, and like I say, they love calls like that because they love to talk about the gray area of the law where you're not quite sure. So there's plenty of resources for you to avoid violating the ethics law. And I'm here to help and the ethics commission is here to help. So let's get back to where I started and then I'll stop talking because I know I've used way too much time already. Let's talk about legislative matters and talk about quasi-judicial matters. Um, I already mentioned quasi-judicial matters. That's where you're really acting like a judge. Limited set of folks, typically a plan amendment, something else happening to a, a, a subset of properties. Uh, property owners are generally involved in the process uh, directly. Um, we have to insulate you from any ex parte contacts. Uh, we have to address any conflicts of interest uh, very rigorously. We have to make sure that you also don't have any bias against any of the participants in the proceeding. For example, in quasi-judicial matter, you really act as judges. So generally, people don't want a judge that knows one of the parties or one of the key witnesses to be involved. So if you are involved because you have some bias, because you know the players or you know of the players, you should disclose that or you should at least talk to me about it and potentially uh, stay off that particular matter because of your bias. Uh, so we need to talk about bias. Ex parte context I've already talked about, which means you should avoid talking to anybody involved in the case and they should avoid talking to you and talk to me if there's any issues with that because cases can be reversed if there's ex parte contact that's not disclosed um, and dealt with. Um, with legislative decisions, the rules are much less rigorous. Can you imagine telling a legislator, no, you can't talk to anybody about that bill? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, you get laughed out of the office. Well, uh, so it's similar to that with regard to legislative decisions because it's not affecting a narrow scope of people. It's affecting everybody generally. Um, but we do want to try to control it to some degree because if you're taking input outside the record, that can also be challenging and problematic for me when somebody appeals a legislative ordinance. So we try to keep everything within the record, all communications within the record, so people know what they're appealing and what they're not appealing. But I'm I'm going to be less inclined to seal you in a bag and worry about you on uh, like I do on the quasi-judicial matters. So that's my kind of brief summary of what I would want you to know tonight, um, especially for the, for the newbies here. But I'm happy to answer any questions. And well, as you can already see, I'm a lawyer, so I can talk and talk. I can talk for hours if you want, but you don't want me to do that. So I'm going to stop talking now and see if you have any questions, comments, laughter, ridicule, whatever. Rob, if I could make one, one comment. Um... Most of what the Planning Commission will hear is legislative. So every ordinance that you hear is is legislative. The only quasi-judicial cases that you hear are plan amendments. Um, and we have maybe one or two of those a year. Um, so it's quite limited in 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 that regard. Most of what you'll hear is it, it, your 
serving as a legislator. All right. Well, either I bored you all to tears or anyways. All right. I guess I'm done there. Can't hear me. Thank can you, you, Mr. Bobet. Thank you. Um, I'll just add that I've asked you questions many times, you know, email. And so I encourage anybody else with questions to send them in. Yep. I love questions. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Um, do we have volume? Or? A little bit. Can you hear Commissioner, me? Commissioner Will? Yes. Yeah. You can't hear me now? Yep. Yes. Okay. I just, I had one simple question. I think I understand it, but uh, it, just to clar clarify, when you use the word step down, uh, you meant when there's like, when you have a conflict of interest or if you have a bias, you meant step down from that particular work item, not from the, the board. Oh, yeah. No, we're not going to let you go off the planning commission. Just <laughs> stay away from that matter. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, our second work session is uh, Mr. Uh, Galantine and transit study and transit study executive summary. But now some the summary. Chair Lockwood, do you want to do really quickly the introductions for the other two planning commissioners now that we can hear them? Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. So, um, Commissioners Will and Maury Bidu, I hope you were able to hear the introductions earlier. And would you please go ahead and say a little bit about yourself, Commissioner Maury Bidu? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I am Commissioner Maury Bidu. I work or I live in Central Beaverton. And I work in affordable housing finance. I work for a not-for-profit organization that serves as a mission-based lender that serves um, the state of Oregon. Um, and I've been on the planning commission since 2021. Uh, I too have a degree that's um, policy focused. And so have uh, between affordable housing experience and my just general academic interests, um, found that um, serving on the planning commission um, is something that I find very interesting and a lot of fulfillment in. And also like Chair Lockwood was brought in by somebody who was um, already a commissioner, a prior commissioner who suggested that um, it might be something um, interesting to me. Thank you. Commissioner Will. Uh, yeah, my name is Morgan. Um, Last name Will, not to be confused. That people some that call, accidentally call me Will. Uh, it's Morgan, first name. And I um, live in the Cedar Mill area of unincorporated Washington County. I uh, used to live in the Shoals Ferry area uh, when I was younger. So I've lived in different parts of the county. I um, grew up with a grandfather who built houses for a living um, in Idaho. So I always had an interest in uh, development. And I went uh, and got a, a master's degree in urban and regional planning. And so for the last 25 years or so, I've worked uh, in consulting. I've worked with real estate developers and um, couple, I've been on the commission for a couple of years. And I really wanted to, you know, spend my free time giving back to the community and uh, sharing, uh, you know, my time, uh, bringing my knowledge to uh, support Washington County. So I'm, I'm pleased to be on the commission. I welcome you guys. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Valentine. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chair, Commissioners. Good to see some new members. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Deami Valentine. I'm the Principal Transportation Planner. Look forward to working with you more over the future years here. So I'm here to uh, share a little bit about uh, an effort that has been underway for a handful of well, almost a year and a half now, Washington County Transit Study. This is a, an effort that was really born out of a lot of kind of building upon a, a number of previous efforts, uh, including county's transit, uh, transportation system plan, as well as uh, an effort uh, about seven years ago, the Transportation Future Study, which I really identified that in order to meet our future transportation 
demands trans transit really needed to play a, a critical role in in serving uh, our community so this is uh, a summation of that and some additional efforts uh, that I'll, I'll describe here and so sharing some findings and some recommendations with you this evening so the project purpose uh really as i mentioned we're, we're trying to identify a, a vision a shared vision uh, this is an effort that was funded in part uh, with washington county as well as the cities of beaverton tiger tualatin and hillsborough and uh, to, to have a shared vision of what transit looks like over the next 20 years and recognizing that really to make it successful we have to have a partnership at the local level in addition to what the, the transit providers are, are bringing to the table in terms of services. So this is really kind of framed around, you know, how do we best accomplish some of these bigger goals, thinking about, you know, improving equitable access to our community, thinking about the environmental benefit that transit provides, it's really an efficient uh, mode of uh, transport. Uh, thinking about how it provides access to opportunity and really uh, brings uh, people to and grows economic vi vitality uh, rooted in the customer experience. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, really recognizing that this is a, a, a partnership. So this is a tough, uh, difficult graph graphic to uh, read, but it illustrates our process over the last 18 months, which was uh, supported by a technical working group, which included agency and city staff uh, from throughout the county, um, also supported by stakeholder uh, members. We uh, convened several workshops over that period of time and uh, had a, a fair amount of robust engagement uh, that I'll describe a little bit more in terms of meeting people on the street where they are, uh, also had uh, online presence as well uh, to get solicit input. So some of that uh, input that we heard in terms of what's working well today and, and thinking about uh, how we can better serve our, our community's needs. What's working well is people think, uh, see transit as an affordable travel option. Uh, they see it as convenient. Uh, it's nice to be able to use your time uh, more productively when you're on transit. And they also, uh, for community members uh, that take advantage of right connection services, which is uh, the community and first last mile uh, employer shuttles that operate uh, throughout the county, they really saw that as, a, as a, a good model and wanted to build upon that. And then in terms of what were some of the barriers to people either using it or using it more, uh, really the perception of safety was a concern for folks. Um, travel times, especially if you're trying to get uh, around the county from North County to South County, can take as long as three to six times as long to travel by transit versus driving a car. Um, stops not located in where they either want to uh, catch transit or they, where their destination is. Uh, and then accessing transit is uh, more of a challenge, especially where there's um, lack of sidewalks or adequate crossings. The service just isn't meeting their needs in terms of frequency or uh, times of day. And then uh, just lack of awareness about what uh, the system looks like and how to, to use it. So we had an uh, online survey and we, we differentiated the response, uh, the responses that we received from those who are using transit today. So how how can we better uh, perform? Uh, you know, how can we better serve transit uh, from the user perspective? But then also from those who are not currently using transit, thinking about how what would encourage them to use transit. In this case, we asked you know, which of the following improvements would you like to see, and from those who are using transit, thinking about uh, wanting it to be faster wanting to better serve their uh, their needs, um, their schedules, thinking about the comfort in terms of when they're using it and how they're accessing it. Similar kind of refrain from what we heard um, from the in-person engagement. 
And then in terms of the uh, inverse from folks who are not currently using it, uh, travel speed was really a priority for folks uh, in terms of they saw it as being too slow. Uh, and then also that that sense of the perception of safety and perception as reality. Uh, and so uh, addressing that was um, kind of came through in this survey. So I'm going to walk through. We have uh, an executive summary online. We're uh, in a we're seeking public comment on that draft executive sub summary through March 1st. So if you're interested and haven't ha had an opportunity to take advantage of it, I encourage you to review that. So it has a little bit more details, but I'm going to provide just a high level summary of kind of the eight recommendations that are coming out of this effort, which the uh, first priority is thinking about the, the system that is going to serve the most people, the longest distances, really provide a, a network, a backbone of um, uh, connectivity through the high capacity transit system. So that's thinking about, uh, you know, the max is kind of our one high capacity transit uh, network in Washington County. We think there's opportunities to build upon that. There's other uh, models of service potentially that could be um, more frequent, like a bus rapid transit, for example, is another example of that. And so this is identifying a number of corridors that could potentially uh, be competitive for federal funding uh, for more infrastructure investments. So framing it in what can we do at the local level to, to make these more competitive, it's really preparing these corridors to be more competitive. And so that's a, there's some land use components. There's other elements that are addressed in some of these other recommendations, but this, this reflects what we think are the, the top tier priorities uh, for Washington County. And this is also reflected in the regional's high capacity transit uh, system. In addition to that, also thinking about the, the frequent service network. So frequency uh, typically defined, frequent service is typically defined as 15 minutes. You know, a bus would arrive every 15 minutes. So uh, a network of those frequent service uh, buses and really advocating for that and thinking about what what is that grid of, of service that we need uh, in Washington County. So it's a lot of our materials really should have frequent, adequate uh, service. And then as I, as I mentioned, uh, we partner with uh, Ride Connection to uh, provide those community connector and job connector shuttles and really building on that as a service model in areas where fixed route transit is not really a viable uh, alternative. So we have identified areas where we think that that's that more uh, flexible, dynamic, um, smaller vehicle type of service uh, can, can best serve our community members to really with the intent of getting them connected to that high capacity transit network or frequent route service network and and or their uh, destinations within their communities. And then in, in order to address some of those concerns about travel times, you know, identifying opportunities and uh, those key corridors where travel speed and reliability improvements can be uh, implemented. And, um, you know, we outlined kind of a set of tools and a toolbox of, um, of those improvements that as the road authority, you know, we're well suited to uh, accommodate and address when we're thinking about capital projects, um, road improvements, uh, quick fix, smaller type of improvements that could potentially um, save uh, transit riders um, time. And then also thinking about the you know, everybody is a, a pedestrian to start a transit trip. Uh, at some point in your your trip, you are um, you're either accessing a, a stop uh, by walking or biking. We think there's other opportunities to have more shared mobility options in Washington County as well. Uh, so thinking about these um, kind of nodes of of travel options that could potentially supplement our uh, transit network and extend the reach of uh, those trips. With that, improving 
the the network of uh, bicycle and walking facilities uh, being a priority to to address some of those gaps within Washington County's uh, road network. Think about trails and and other opportunities to improve uh, that pedestrian and bicycle uh, safety. And then thinking about the the programs and that are supportive of uh transit trips you know whether it's employer programs community kind of incentives to um, better uh, promote transit service uh, also think about the land use context providing you know mixed use transit supportive uh type of corridors so it's you know a lot of that is in, already embedded in our land use system and our community development code you know orienting things towards uh, transit, making sure that we have good access between our land uses and transit. Um, we think that there's potentially some additional opportunities and, and tweaks that we could uh, make to support that. Supporting programs like the West Side Transportation Alliance, which is our only transportation management agency in Washington County, kind of building out their capacity to better serve our employers. <clears throat> And then uh, recognizing that all of this takes partnerships, coordination, and additional funding to realize what we uh, think are uh, is an adequate transit system uh, for Washington County. Um, so where there's opportunities to advocate for additional uh, funding, uh, whether it's public-private partnerships, uh, we've identified a, a couple of best practices that we could uh, you know, potentially pursue in the future around transit and uh, enhancing services. So this just illustrates uh, kind of the summation of some of these uh, aspects that I've talked about in terms of the, the, the service vision. So it's, you know, thinking about that frequent service, those shuttle areas. So we have, we have this map that illustrates that. We also have a, a supporting map, not not very easy to read in this format. Apologies for that, but uh, reflecting those more the high capacity transit network and those capital investments. Um, so, kind of these priority transit corridors where we think uh, we can uh, invest in more significantly. Are they priorities as a group, or do you have them ranked within the group? Or we do have tiers. Yeah, we do um, in the. The full report, which uh, will will come out in April, we have kind of a, a tiered set of priorities. You know, right now we are actively Washington County and other uh, the cities, Metro and TriMet are actively working on TV Highway, for example, as a high capacity transit corridor, looking at improving um, the the transit service along that corridor. 185th is another opportunity that has been identified at the regional level. Um, so yeah, we, we do break out uh, in the report uh, based on some evaluation that we did to identify what those priorities may be. Mm -hmm. So just in terms of those next steps, uh, as I mentioned, we have the, an executive summary that's available in a online format to uh, review and, and provide comment on through March 1st. Uh, we'll be taking in uh, and uh, responding to that comment and providing a final report in April with the, with the idea that our, the board will acknowledge the, the effort and this could potentially inform um, updates to the transportation system plan we also have a transit uh, development plan, which is more of a near-term uh, set of uh, investment priorities. So um, it has direct implications on on some of our uh, policy documents that you may see in the future. And with that, uh, I'm wrapped up. Happy to answer any questions. A quick question. I'm just curious, like how does try might use this is it a tool is it a reference guide are they like thanks for your feedback stay in touch mm -hmm. here's how they use it uh it it certainly is a uh an active conversation they were involved uh through this process 
and uh, they are actually going to be in the process of updating some of their service planning, thinking longer term. Um, I, I think they're kind of they're framing it as forward together 2.0. They came out with kind of a near term uh, set of investment priorities. This will be a longer term. So they're going to take take what we have uh, our recommendations and that will help inform their process. Uh, but it really is going to be kind of you know, a continuing conversation, you know, this at least sets us in a position to say, you know, at those tables, what, what are our priorities uh, when, you know, TriMet is thinking about their uh, annual service planning or, you know, more, more near-term investment priorities. Thank you. Are there questions, commissioners? And Commissioner Will does his, have his hand raised. Well, thank you. Commissioner Will. Thank you, Chair Lockwood. Um, my question is, um, I, I'm just reviewing the hard copy you sent uh, with the draft executive summary from January 2024. I think it was page 12. There was uh, it was number four of a list of um, what they call recommendations to achieve the transit vision. And I was particularly uh, impressed by you know recommendation number four where. There are some different implement speed and reliability improvements. There's a neat, nice graphic here with four examples. Um, big, just a big picture question: Like, does our existing county capital improvement project include projects like this? Is there a transit list of how you know at a certain intersection maybe we could update the the signal to give transit priority, or or is this a new idea that we don't do? Uh, it is fairly new. We actually have a demonstration project that we had um, that we implemented with support from TriMet a handful of years ago at the intersection of 185th and Cornell. It's just some paint treatments. There was a, a some signal modification, but that that's an example, and that was really a, a the first, like I said, a demonstration project for Washington County. Um, so it is it is fairly new. It's something that we think that there's probably more opportunities to better integrate uh, early on in project development uh, processes uh, as our you know capital projects team is um, doing their design. Yeah, that's it. That's where I I guess my final comment is that how great it would be if we looked at some of our existing capital improvement projects and said, well, can we incorporate some of these things into it? Is there budget or is there an angle on it? Because I always hate to see them fix a brand new intersection and they used old school techniques and didn't didn't take into these these great new things you guys are coming up with, you know, because that, that capital improvement project was placed on a list seven years ago and it's finally coming to fruition, but they're not using the cutting edge, you know, options. So I think it's a really great document. I, I hope we can get those things into our capital improvement budget. Thank you. Commissioner Moribidu has her hand up. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead, Commissioner Moribidu. Thank you. Um, along the same lines, I was wondering if in this um, process in the technical working group, um, were you looking at um, current population needs or were you also considering um, like you can see actually if you go back to oh. slides i think the map like you can see out here like for example we all know that river terrace is getting pretty developed very quickly and it could be a really good um opportunity to integrate um transit into uh, like normalizing utilizing transit into a community that's new um if it is there you know, as people are moving in, I also understand that, you know, transit doesn't really go somewhere until there's a need. So there's this kind of chicken and egg thing. So I was just wondering if that was um, considered in the working group. And then separately, um, when the technical working group was put together, um, what kind of equity outreach was utilized? And do you think there's any um, holes in uh, represented groups? Yeah, thank you for those questions. Um, yeah, in terms of thinking about especially our new growth areas, that that was an emphasis of this this effort, thinking uh, specifically around that the land use context and what type of uh, transit um, service model would best serve those. That's that's where these you know more 
flexible dynamic uh, services may make most sense. So, you know, uh, in River Terrace, we show, uh, for example, you mentioned that, so I'll just note this. It's kind of an exciting project that uh, we are uh, funding with support of uh, the state of Oregon, a, what we're calling micro transit pilot in South Beaverton and River Terrace area, which will be more of a, a flexible kind of think Uber, but for transit uh, in this area to provide connections to potentially the max where we're in the planning phase to, to identify what how it's best gonna serve the community down there. But that that's kind of an example of, uh, you know, proving up transit and ridership, uh, you know, that, that service model could in five years, TriMet could say, hey, this is really successful. We see the value or or the benefit of of providing you know a, a larger you know fixed route service, for example. We've seen this uh, happen in a couple examples. North Hillsboro, TriMet will be taking over services that were previously provided by uh, Ride Connection in, in more of a, a smaller uh, format. We're also seeing this in uh, Tualatin. So that that is kind of a, a good um, kind of proving up model to uh, to illustrate the, the need um, for transit and the demand for transit. In terms of your second question, uh, I I was uh, impressed by a lot of the engagement that we had. We partnered with uh, uh, organization community liaisons. Uh, now I'm blanking, sorry. <laughs> it was. We did, our, our consultant team included um, a group that was born out of uh, community engagement, really focusing on uh, communities that are historically uh, under in, engaged in these processes. And uh, they have kind of broadened their scope and, and are developing relationships in Washington County. They were able to, community engagement liaisons, thank you. Uh, but their their focus is really you know meeting people where they are and so they were um, throughout the county we had good representation uh, they were able to talk to about 300 people on the ground at transit stops coffee shops churches libraries uh, and you know had a, had a questionnaire but it was it was kind of organic conversations and as well but we were able to kind of document um, and uh, you know, needs from community members that, you know, wouldn't typically be engaged in this type of a process. Yeah. Other questions? I have a couple questions. Um, the, um, that high capacity transit, um, how many years do you think it would take before that was operating you know any of those routes or you know I, you talked about you know the need for funding and i'm just wondering what's the timeline on that well that's a great question you know we uh this is kind of a 20-year plan uh thinking uh realistically you know we've we've had uh first max service was uh, extended out to washington county in 80 six i believe extended in early 90s i haven't seen much uh west could be considered um you know a, a high capacity transit potentially uh but obviously needs uh more investment to really achieve that uh these things take a long time to to plan and and um in order to be successful seeking federal funding you know those are very competitive uh, the region as a whole has been pretty successful in in getting uh, funding for high capacity transit, um, but I think in in order to, you know, we're seeing, for example, TV Highway. We've been in the process of uh, planning that for a, a while, a handful of years, and probably not for another five years at the earliest. So these things take take a while. Um, you know, Southwest Corridor is another example. A lot of uh, investment in planning for and and uh, you know things can stall in terms of getting 
federal funding and uh, and or local funding. So, um, realistically, you know, if if you're, it's probably ten years, ten to fifteen years before uh, some major, you know, that level of investment uh, is realized. Good. Um, my other question was around the mobility hub. I just was wondering if any of them currently exist or if that's something that's, you know, purpose built or is it something that happens organically or how that works? Yeah, I mean, it can be, uh, it certainly can happen organically. We've seen um, over uh, the last 10 years, um, you know, some shared mobility services um, have started to kind of uh, organically develop around certain areas or in our serving certain areas more. Um, they, but they can also, and what we've identified is they can, there can be some intentionality around that as well and can be supported, you know, thinking about, you know, how, how the curb is managed. If there's, you know, um, uh, bike parking, for example, that can be uh, secure, you know, that's more of a, a public offering uh, that, could be leveraged. Um, so there is, there's some intentionality potentially. Thanks. Any other questions? Commissioner Fry. I don't think I have very well formulated questions as much as um, some like, comments and observations and ponderings as I went through all this. Um, I think in, in some ways, in the vein that Commissioner Moybidu is talking about, it seems like we have all these new areas that could get planned up front for transit and it could get kind of built into the, the process. But those same areas, um, and yeah, I, I'm going to back up. I don't, I don't know if I said this or if I just thought at first. I don't envy what you're doing um, here because I looked at this and I was like, wow, this is just incredibly complex. And I don't know how you with these existing neighborhoods and cities and all this stuff going on and, and roads, how do you make this work for people? Um, it, it's clearly not easy. Um, but so as I was looking at that and thinking about all these areas that just don't have access and we continue to build areas that don't really have good access to transit um, and we get into this loop of, um, you know, get into the, the board together report, which I don't particularly care for the name of because it doesn't really feel like it's very together when, when you look at the, th the areas that are being eliminated from service and uh, the areas that continue to have more. Um, I just think that we're, we're losing access and connectivity to so many things and it's hard to get back to it. Um, so I look at areas like North Bethany, which is based on TriMet's plan, getting wiped out of service. Um, and I think about how how many people live there how many people could use transit and i think about you know beyond just the suburban feel that we can associate it with we have um retirement communities and um, we have apartments and multifamily areas and we have uh you know, like jobs and things that are right in that area to have now have lost or are losing access to transit and just trying to think how can we continue to get in, into these areas, not lose it for them, understand we're trying to serve the most people and and we're trying to make it efficient. But the big observation is how can we make it so we can, as we develop new areas, we can make it transit ready, transit friendly. Like even if it takes 20 years to get it there, we got the plan. Um, and then how can we try and make sure that the people who are already in these neighborhoods don't just get completely cut off because all those reasons, when if the bus comes and you can can't get anywhere, it takes forever. It never shows up, or you have to walk, you know, a mile and a half to get to the bus. Nobody's going to take the bus, so it's kind of that that's that cycle that we have to figure out how to break. Um, I guess that's kind of my rant. Like I said, I'm not really sure if I have questions other than you know I'm hoping that we're able to continue to work toward those goals as we plan. Well, I'm, I will uh, just provide a comment. I'm glad you brought up North Bethany and um, and I, I like Chair Lockwood's kind of framing around intentionality and and uh, there was some intentionality when that community was being developed, thinking about 
you know, providing uh, transit layovers, for example, into the urban design and the urban form. You know, that, that that's kind of a uh, small element, but it's still an important, you know, thinking about providing, uh, you know, uh, restrooms, for example, to, to drivers. You know, those are kind of basic needs uh, to encourage service at some point in the future. It still requires the community to... Um, mature and and you know that where that node is for example along kaiser road has not developed yet so it's it's still forthcoming as you note it's going to take time uh, for these communities to mature but in terms of uh, uh north beth i just wanted to note um for uh your benefit the uh there is service that ride connection is going to be planning it's an, an another kind of a shuttle model uh, to serve the North, the, the Bethany community. So they're in the planning process now. We'd love to engage uh, with folks around um, how that can best serve the community, but it's going to connect PCC to Sunset Transit Center, essentially reflecting the same service that is now being discontinued by TRAMAP. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing any, so thank you very much. Thank you. So our next item is um, going to be on ordinance 900. We typically take a break at about 90 minutes and we're a little short of that, but maybe it's a good idea to take a break before we start in on this ordinance. So uh, without objection, a five minute break.
I believe we're back except for, is Commissioner Will still with us? He had planned to leave at 7.30, so I believe he has left. Oh, he had to leave at 7.30, okay. Well, our next item is a public hearing on ordinance 900 and we'll start with the staff presentation, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Steve Kelly, a senior planner with the department here, senior transportation planner. Uh, you have before you this evening uh, ordinance number 900, a nice uh, round number, uh, and it's related to uh, transportation system plan uh, amendments and general uh, updates in, in overall characterized as being uh, minor updates. Um, I want to start by saying I may, in some of the slides, may refer to the transportation system plan as a TSP. And um, if I use that acronym or one of the slides uses that acronym, uh, it means transportation system plan. Um, I also want to point out this is uh, uh, one of the few time, first time, I think, that we have included uh, an overview of uh, the provisional um, findings of goal compliance with uh, the staff report. Again, these are draft. Um, the uh, new changes, I heard several of you talk about Oregon's planning system in the introductions, and there were significant changes to the transportation planning rule um, quite recently. Um, the most recent of those was uh, adopted in last November, and we sort of um, uh, waited until after they were finalized before filing this ordinance to make sure we knew what we had to comply with. Um, but these new rules are called the uh, Climate Friendly and Equitable Communities Rules, and they're a major update to Oregon's transportation planning uh, system, uh, Oregon's planning system, actually. Um, so I will be uh, talking about those very briefly, but wanted to give you that update. And I also wanted to mention that the transportation planning in Oregon um, in those rules and everywhere else has always and continues to occur in two phases. The first phase is our transportation system plan, which provides for the general location, general function, and mode of transportation facilities. The second phase is project development. A uh, project is normally on the transportation system plan, uh, before it can enter the, the project development phase, although in some cases the project development phase needs to advance a little ways in order to figure out exactly what needs to go on the transportation system plan. So there's that. That continues to go on with us. Um, uh, transportation system plans also include uh, policies and programs, inventories, and other, um, other information. Um, this These amendments are map amendments predominantly to the roadway system, the pedestrian system, the bicycle system, and the trans, uh, transit system maps. So ordinance number 900 responds to uh, recent transportation planning projects. Uh, the, the planning was the project, and these have been adopted by um, the city of Hillsborough as far as a TSP, transportation system plan update, the city of Tigard has also updated their transportation system plan. Um, we are including our work on the Council Creek uh, Trail uh, planning, uh, as well as uh, TriMet's Forward Together uh, service plan. Uh, these, all of these planning efforts have included significant public engagement. Um, and these changes, th these engagement processes have occurred through their respective planning efforts. Um, so we're bringing forward the, the outcome of those engagement processes um, with this ordinance. A high level overview of the city of Hillsborough's transportation plan update. Um, it was a comprehensive update, finally adopted in 2022, um, has a updated uh, comprehensive plan and uh, comprehensive plan policies and goals. And, and really the key element that they worked on was the comprehensive update to the bicycle plan. They went through street by street and identified 
the uh, bicycle facilities that are desired uh, throughout the city of Hillsboro on each side of the street by the type of, of bicycle facility. It was really a comprehensive update. I, I was really impressed by it. Um, and so that was the main element there, but there was a bunch of other um, tweaks and uh, uh, other changes to the transporta their transportation plan um, uh, as well. Um, the city of Tigard's transportation plan update was also a major uh, transportation uh, system plan update. Uh, it included the uh, complete streets policy, uh, as well as their Tigard uh, Triangle Strategic Plan and the Washington Square Regional Center Plan update. And both of these plans sort of serve as um, a type of sub area for uh, the county. And, and we um, provide technical support to the cities and uh, work cooperatively, cooperatively with them through um, that process, through their process. Uh, we also include the uh, Council Creek Regional Trail. This is currently identified as a, a refinement area on our transportation system plan, and the amendments proposed would uh, remove the refinement area for the and include the uh, the recommended general alignment, uh, which is recommended to be uh, coincident with the Portland and Western uh, Railroad uh, right of way, and would start down here in Hillsboro and extend all the way to. Uh, uh, Pacific University in Forest Grove. And also it includes the uh, Trinet Forward Together service con uh, concept, uh, which has been evolving um, after the pandemic, expanding um, access and coverage, uh, more frequent service, but also at the same time, as I, I heard comments earlier, uh, regarding it's, it's no longer uh, as focused on the, the peak hour and the hub and spoke system. So there is, uh, there are some some uh, changes uh, recommended by the uh, the TriMet um, planning efforts. So moving on to the um, content of the ordinance, uh, the roadway system changes um, are in Exhibit One, and they include um, roadway system includes the functional classification map amendments and which I'll talk about what functional classification uh, is in just a moment, uh, as well as some, some lane number map uh, uh, amendments. And I'll talk about what those do in a moment uh, and refinement area updates and a uh, change that identifies a special right of way need area for Jackson School Road. Uh, functional classification is the role that each uh, roadway facility serves in the transportation network. So a freeway has the most amount of uh, mobility function, but doesn't have access to local properties. Local roads uh, have much less mobility. Uh, they're designed to provide access to uh, local properties and, and nearby land uses. And the rest of the system is that spectrum in between. Um, as a, uh, so these are the, the classifications we have for roads in, in our plan. Um, as a transportation planner, uh, this uh, system design slide on the uh, my right anyway uh, lays out the uh, the required uh, metro regional um, transportation functional plan, uh, their requirements for how an ideal system would look, and and they recognize and have uh, rules that allow for. Um, uh, spacing based on the constraints, as well as um, this sort of grid ideal. In Washington County, you'll see that we have a number of uh, constraints that influence how the system gets laid out. So it rarely looks like this ideal grid. Um, what we have as constraints typically are rivers, streams, creeks, uh, railroad lines, uh, power, transmission corridors, uh, freeways, and, and, and other sorts of topography that um, prevent this kind of, of grid. But this is what we're trying to achieve, is a basically a one mile spacing between arterials with a collector at a, roughly a halfway in between. Could, um, excuse mm -hmm. me, Mr. Kelly. Um, I'm not sure if you've already said, but could you briefly tell us what an arterial is and what a collector is? Yeah, so an, an arterial, 
um, is a, a major roadway. It, it provides for a, a significant mobility function, connects um, freeways, generally connect to arterials. Um, and then the uh, rest of the system gets accessed through uh, lower classifications or less mobility focused classifications of roadways. So the arterial is a larger road like 185th or uh, Tualatin Valley Highway um, that, that predominantly serves the mobility function, may also have some, some access, uh, but it, it, it is uh, uh, based on mobility. And that's what this standard or uh, idealized direction uh, provides for. Thanks. So there's a number of, of functional classifications shown in exhibit one. Um, the uh, lower functional classification there is intended to indicate that roadways that would provide uh, more of an access oriented. Um, and then the higher functional classification there is more of a, a mobility access oriented. So we often think of it as stepping up to the higher, uh, higher degree of, of mobility. Um, there are uh, also included several uh, proposed roads in developing areas, and the city of Hillsboro also eliminated uh, several uh, railroad crossings that were previously proposed. The, um, the lane number changes, again, came through both the city of Tigard and the city of Hillsboro's transportation plan updates. Um, the majority of the changes, and all of them in Tigard, happen to be changes that reduce the plan number of lanes. Uh, from the sort of that broad four lane arterial with center turn lanes where needed that four to five lane uh, standard down to uh, one travel lane in each direction with a center turn lane um, where it's needed. Um, and the, uh, the roadways that are listed there are um, significant changes. They're uh, less capacity on Durham Road and Hall Boulevard as well as Greenberg Road and 72nd Avenue, all in Tiger. Uh, the city of Hillsborough ended up with more of a mix of changes to their plan. Um, they had a number of uh, uh, areas that they reduced the lane numbers or uh, have designated it to match the way it's actually constructed. Uh, so uh, there are some of those instances that pop up as well as they do have a one recommendation for a county road, um, it's, it's West Union Road, uh, where it's a short segment um, that would increase from uh, its current plan designation of two, uh, two or three lanes to four or five lanes. Um, and that actually is directly related to the Shoft Road Extension Refinement Area. Um, up in the North Hillsboro Industrial Area, there was in Hillsboro's uh, transportation system plan uh, until a couple years ago, the uh, uh, Shoff Road extension proposed. Um, the refinement planning was actually completed when an industrial building went in in that area, uh, but the plan had not been updated yet. So we continued to coordinate with them uh, and they identified when the building went in that the solution would be um, that West Union would, would be the, uh, uh, the preferred um, uh, resolution to the refinement area and um, that they finally updated their plan. And so uh, here we are recommending their recommendation to our road, uh, which is uh, to add a short segment, which would be that four to five lane designation on West Union. Um, 124th Avenue, we also had a refinement area there that was related to the opportunities for um, the construction of the roadway. Uh, the roadway has been constructed. The alignment is now known, hopefully, and uh, there's no need for the refinement area. Anymore. So the recommendation is to remove it. Also, up here on Jackson School Road, um, the state rules now require that um, urban growth boundary of lines follow the um, right-of-way line. When the Jackson School Row, uh, area became uh, added to the urban growth boundary. That line did not do so. It is in the middle of the right of way and angled kind of oddly. And so 
what we included in the uh, proposal is to have a description that says that the uh, improvements must be within the uh, urban side or the urban area. And that would um, guide any improvements, uh, whether they're safety or capacity related uh, for any project that went in, whether that's development that was required to do an improvement or uh, the city or county uh, public project that would go in as a separate following step in the future to serve the now urban area up there. Pausing for just a second, see if there's any questions about any well, of those. I have a question. So does that mean that if a road were to be improved and widened, you'd, you'd need to take land from the urban side? Right, and it would be not only the urban land, but it would be related to making sure the improvement was pushed over further, depending upon where that urban growth boundary line is in the right of way at that point. So um, as it's angled, the improvements would have to be entirely within the urban area. Yeah. So exhibit two covers, um, covers uh, the other the, the other elements of our transportation system than than roadways um, and the the first part of that is uh, related to our our pedestrian system uh, uh, amendments um, our transportation Washington County's transportation plan has uh, two designations for for trails uh, regional trails and community trails um, these are designation changes. They're not um, that, that describe the function of the trail in the network. Uh, the design and attributes, size, and other aspects of the trail are determined when the trail um, is is planned through the project development process, um, and that's often available based on available space, um, the expected users. Uh, and other design characteristics of the uh, operating agency. The trail system amendments uh, include a number of recent trail refinement planning uh, processes that our community has gone through. And those include um, the Beaverton Creek Trail, the uh, Cedar Creek Trail in Sherwood, um, the Council Creek Trail, uh, as well as the Crescent Parkway, uh, uh, Greenway in Hillsboro, uh, the Fano Creek Trail in Tiger. The final piece of that has finally been, uh, the refinement plan has been completed, and the Red Rock Creek Trail uh, over Oregon 217 in Tiger. Our bicycle system, like the pedestrian system, has, has two um, designations. Uh, major street bikeways and enhanced major street bikeways. Uh, major street bikeways are every arterial and collector in the urban area. It, it functions as a major street bikeway. It's planned as a major street bikeway. So when the functional classification changes to an arterial or a collector, um, it is intended to also change that that road that was whatever it was before is now also uh, a major street and a major street bikeway would be appropriate. Those may have either uh, be planned for either a, a, a six foot bike lane or a buffered bike lane. So at a minimum, every arterial and collector is planned for a bicycle uh, facility. Some roads are further designated as enhanced major street bicycle facilities in the county's transportation system plan. And those roads would be planned to incorporate either a buffered uh, bike lane, uh, which overlaps with uh, the other major street bikeways, or they might have a separated uh, facility, a separated cycle track or, or bikeway. Um, so specifically, the city of Hillsborough plan, uh, a picture of which is shown up there, uh, identified by each side of the road uh, what sort of bicycle facility would be um, it, it planned for in that that segment. Um, so wherever they've done that on either side of the road, the uh, Ordinance 900 proposes that the county also designated as an enhanced major street bikeway wherever they have a um, separated facility identified. 
Mm-hmm. I just want a quick question. Go ahead. Mostly because I think I just need to put this in my own language. Okay. Uh, is it fair to say that when a road gets an upgrade in terms of like what type of road it is, then the bike system also gets an upgrade? When, <laughs> when a new uh, road project is um, completed to standard, mm-hmm. um, then the standard would include a, a, a bicycle facility. Um, depending upon the type, whether it's a major street or an enhanced uh, major street bikeway. That could be through a project that's a, a land development action and they're required to complete the street um, in front of their site or, or even offsite. Um, or it could be a public action that goes in and, and builds a roadway or part of a roadway. So some roads are not to standard. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, many of them are not <laughs> yeah. to standard, right? So what we're planning for is a complete system, but we don't have one today. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's why the plan is important. And it identifies what the projects will look like, uh, need to look like, and the goals for them uh, when they do go out and get constructed and put on the ground. Um, so the Hillsborough bike plan uh, guided the designations in, in, in Hillsborough. Um, based on their transportation system plan. And then Tigard also had um, two um, roadway concept plans they've completed for Greenberg Road and 72nd Avenue. And both of those show separated uh, bicycle facilities. So we uh, also propose that they become uh, enhanced major street bikeways uh, in the county's plan. Um, there also is a segment on uh, 160th that would connect the um, West Side Trail head across TV Highway and down 160th. So if 160th is ever um, constructed to standard, the standard would be an enhanced major street bikeway um, for that segment. And that's really related to our our pedestrian trail planning, um, uh, trail system planning, which includes both pedestrian and bicycles. Um, And it has a, a short segment there to connect into both the West Side Trail and is it the TV Trail that's the uh, the other trail there? Pretty sure. Um, the TV Highway Trail. Or is that the Surf to Turf Trail? The Walton Valley Trail. Walton Valley Trail, right. <laughs> and moving on to um, the transit system, I took note when Diami mentioned a moment ago that the transit study would inform the transit transportation system plan, uh, because that has not been fully incorporated into ordinance 900 yet uh, at, at this point. Um, we don't believe there's anything that would be inconsistent uh, between the two, um, but this is um, based on um, the, well, these are the classifications in our transportation system plan to date. Um, <clears throat> And our, our transit study will help uh, prioritize and refine our, our transit system uh, going forward. And so the transit system changes uh, include incorporating TriMet's Forward Together service plan. Um, they also include our efforts working with the interregional uh, transit service providers. Uh, we, we list SMART there. It's a little bit of both of uh, interregional and uh, a community of uh, for Wilson community service for Wilsonville local transit service for Wilsonville uh, ride connection uh, as well as includes our uh, community connector service amendments um, those are listed at the end of exhibit two on pages 33 and 34 of exhibit two uh, and the also uh, the southwest corridor light rail transit project has uh, identified in the Federal Register a a locally preferred alternative. It's not funded. Um, It's likely to change before it gets funded in some way, shape, or form. We know that, but um, we felt it was appropriate for our transportation plan, the county's transportation plan, to incorporate that that locally preferred alternative. So this was our opportunity to to do so as as part of this ordinance. And lastly, um, in the uh, overview of the ordinance is the um, uh, provisional findings that were attached to your your staff report. Um, We uh, recognize that there has been a major change uh, to the way that um, 
planning is done in Oregon um, and the transportation planning rule there um, uh, still allows for a, an amendment of this type, an interim uh, transportation plan amendment. Uh, we also recognize this sort of as hybrid. It follows the old rules, uh, old rules and procedures, old, uh, but they're not uh, not incompatible with the, um, the the new rules. And the findings go through uh, uh, and analyze the the new rules and and provide for consistency with with those as well. Um, furthermore, we also recognize that the bottom three bullets there, uh, the Oregon Highway Plan is in the process of uh, uh, being scoped for a, a, a major update, uh, or uh, Metro's uh, Urban Growth Management Functional Plan may be updated later this year, as well as the Regional Transportation Functional Plan. Um, so we recognize that those changes are coming and could be important uh, aspects going forward, uh, but did want to provide you with a, a, a copy of our draft uh, provisional findings. Um, and that's a new practice for us that we um, hope to be able to continue. Uh, and with that, um, our recommendation tonight is that staff can, or that the planning commission conduct the, uh, the public hearing and uh, recommend approval of ordinance 900 uh, to the board of commissioners. I believe we had one gentleman here that was interested in uh, the Council Creek Trail, and I'm not sure if he stuck around. I think he was more interested in the aspects of trail planning than perhaps uh, the Planning Commission's deliberations. I don't see him here anymore. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Um, at this point, are there any clarifying questions from commissioners? Um, just kind of a background question, Mr. Kelly. So is this sort of process just done periodically, or is it triggered when a certain amount of municipalities decide to update their plans? Yes, both. Um, <laughs> absolutely. Um, workload based also, um, but we had a, a similar ordinance to this uh, a, a few years ago, uh, and we recognize this is kind of an odd thing for you to be picking up the first time, um, that it's a uh, amendment to existing maps um, to be consistent with other adopted plans. So what you have in the ordinance shows that, but it doesn't really give you a lot of context about it. So that's, I'm hoping the staff report and uh, my presentation tonight will sort of maybe filled in some of the pieces for the planning commission. Um, if you have questions, now's the time. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we did an ordinance very similar to this in, I think it was 20... 21. It was 21. I think it was a little bit before that, but um, we can check. Well, yeah, we do these on a semi-irregular kind of kind of basis where it's just an update to match other ongoing and already adopted in many cases. Efforts. And if I could add just a little context to that too, transportation system plans are unique amongst our comprehensive plan documents in that they are both intended as long range visionary planning documents, but they're also used for development review. So it's really important that the transportation plans stay current, and that's part of why we want to include the city's revisions, their plans, into our plan, so that when we have development applications come in, we know we have, let's say, the right lane numbers designation in our plan. Otherwise, it causes confusion for those processes. So that's why the TSP gets updated, minor updates like this, much more often than any of our other comprehensive plan elements, probably. And we are really, we're directed to provide concurrence with local plans as well so we're we're it's mo almost an administrative process that we're going through uh to to reflect and, and be consistent with those local plans thank you other questions i'll have a lot of no. thank you chair lockwood i am curious about the the lanes the the roads and tiger that are reducing the number of lanes and i think some of those in actuality have more lanes than that now so I'm curious what the mechanics are for that and if that affects the, the bicycle planning. Yes, thank you. Um, the lanes, that, the, the lane numbers in Tigard are, um, I don't know if I can go back to a slide that shows anything that's relevant. Um, they're, they're, they're displayed um, in, in the exhibit um, and I can find the page number. The, um, the, the lane numbers in Tigard 
have uh, the changes to Hall Boulevard. ODOT has expressed concern uh, about those. Um, they, they have several locations where they have more right of way now. They, they uh, uh, required development to provide additional right of way than would be needed with the new Tigard um, recommendations to the ODOT facility there. Um, and they're working on what sort of bicycle facility would be appropriate or what would be appropriate to do um, in those locations. I don't have specifics. I think that's a site by site sort of circumstance. Um, the, the other changes, I, I don't think there's any <laughs> extra right of way sitting out there. I think the change to Durham Road is really one more of practicality. Um, it's built to the three lane standard now. Um, and they just realized that in our priorities, they didn't see it as being something that they could afford to go forward with as a public project and didn't see many opportunities for redevelopment. Um, so they, they, their recommendation there for their road, their change was to uh, incorporate the, the three lane uh, cross section. Um, and they took a hard look at the um, trade-offs for, for that. The, the Greenberg Road changes, um, again, are, are practicality. There's not a lot of extra right-of-way or space in there. They've been working on those through their um, uh, planning at the uh, regional center, the Washington Square Regional Center. They had a, a community come in uh, nearby, uh, a development uh, of some apartments nearby, and that really got them thinking about how can we connect uh, across this facility better. They've, they've done a, a streetscape uh, profile a concept plan for Greenberg uh, through the town, the regional center, as well as connecting further further south and arrived at the, the three lane designation. The same process in the Tiger Triangle for a similar process in the Tiger Triangle for 72nd Avenue. Um, so they, they've they've done a lot of work, and really their their transportation plan was a summation of their other work that they had had already uh, brought forward. Did you have a specific concern there? Those were the ones, and nice memory. <laughs> I was supporting them from our staff uh, through each of those processes, so it's not hard to remember. <laughs> sure. Thanks. Any other questions, commissioners? Um, all right, in that case, I will um, open the public hearing. Is anybody signed up to speak to us today? No, we don't have anyone signed up uh, tonight to testify. Would anyone in the virtual audience like to provide testimony on the agenda item? If so, please raise your virtual hand. Doesn't look like we have anyone. Okay, thank you. And that closed the public hearing. Uh, at this point, I'll call for discussion among the uh, commissioners. Any discussion about this um, this ordinance? I actually realized I have a question I didn't ask, so I'll, I'll go with my question. Um, what's the status? You mentioned several things are like provisional or draft or not in a final form. So how do they relate to the ordinance itself you're asked to make right. a decision about. Do you want me to answer that with the change to the findings? We probably should have given the Planning Commission a little bit more of an overview of the provisional or draft findings that we're talking about as a part of this ordinance. Um, Longstanding practice at Washington County, and I cannot explain to you where this came from because it was well before my time at the county, but we did not share our findings until we got to our board hearing where we expected that the ordinance would be adopted or could potentially be adopted. And so at that time, the ordinance is shared as a part of a public hearing with the board, and then the findings are shared as a separate action item for the board to take a separate vote and action on. The findings are a legal requirement that we prepare to say that we believe that this work complies with all necessary state, local, regional policies. It came up recently with a large transportation system plan. Well, very minor update, which was for one specific road, but it generated a lot of public interest that people were looking for the findings and they couldn't find them. And we'd had eight 
something board hearings and no one had seen the findings yet. And so that came up recently in the last couple of months. Um, this was something that I was actually interested in changing for a while because most jurisdictions do share their findings a little bit sooner. Um, you may remember Commissioner Petrillo when he was on the Planning Commission would sometimes ask to see the findings or what we were proposing for the findings. So I think this is a good change to our process where we're sharing those findings early. This is an opportunity for you to review them. And if you see something in the findings that looks like maybe it's not quite complete or you have questions about, it's a good opportunity for us to have the chance to take a look at them and um, polish them up. The reason they're draft or provisional is because we're just not quite done with the process yet. And so there could be something that comes up through the process that would change something that we put in the findings. Um, there could be some changes to the rules as we're going through, depending on how long an ordinance takes. <laughs> there could be changes to policies, in which case we may need to adjust those findings. So the findings will be final when we go into that last board meeting, whenever that happens for this particular ordinance, we will put in the final findings. They will then adopt those by a separate action. Okay, so it's a separate action for us to take action on the- We won't take any action on the findings. Well, that's what provided I mean. We would just, informational for we're you. just doing the mm -hmm. ordinance, right? Yes, yes. So the planning commission will still simply make a recommendation on the ordinance to the board. You won't make a recommendation on the findings specifically, but they're provided to you as background information. Thank you. Yes. But they're not final. Correct. <laughs> Correct. They could change before the board takes action the on board. them. Yes. Board of Commissioner. Yes, the Board of Commissioner. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, this is the point at which um, if there's discussion among commissioners about this um, ordinance, this would be the time, or if there is not discussion, this would be the time to um, offer a motion as to whether to recommend this ordinance to the Board of Commissioners. Is there a motion? I'll do it. Uh, motion to recommend adoption of Ordinance 900. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Um, I think Mr. Bovet prefers a roll call. All right, That's so okay. we will do that. Yeah, very good. All right, may we have a roll call, please? Sure. Commissioner Fry. Vote to approve. Commissioner McClendon. Vote to approve. Commissioner Milliman. Approve. Commissioner Mori Bidu. Yes. Commissioner Monte Blanco. Commissioner Whips? Yes. Chair Lockwood? Yes. Okay, it looks like we have seven in favor of the uh, motion passing. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next item on our agenda is consideration of minutes. And um, I'll go through them one by one. Uh, Planning Commission minutes for November 1st, 2023. Are there any corrections um, the commissioners have to offer for those minutes? There's none. All right, without objection, the minutes for November 1st, 2023 are accepted as submitted. Corrections for the minutes for November 15th, 2023. Are there any corrections on those? Not seeing any hands up. So those minutes for November 15th, 2023 are accepted as submitted. And then finally, minutes for December 6th, 2023. Any corrections there? Not seeing any. Without objection, minutes for December 6th, 2023 are accepted as submitted. Okay. Our next item is planning commission announcements. Does any commissioner have an announcement they wanna make at this time? Anything they want to communicate or share? No. Okay. Well, then let's move to um, our election of officers for 2024. Um, we need to elect a chair and a vice chair. We'll start with the chair. Um, we'll take nominations from the floor. We, nominations do not need a second. Self nominations are allowed. Um, is there a nomination for chair? 
Commissioner Mori Bidu has her hand up. Commissioner Mori Bidu. I would like to uh, nominate uh, Chair Lockwood to continue in her role. Thank you. Thank you for that. Are there any other nominations for chair? Not seeing any. All right. Um, Mr. Bovet, do we need a roll call on this? Uh, I prefer it if you wouldn't mind if there's no other nominations, but maybe you want to do it as a slate to see if there's a motion for vice chair. Vice okay. Chair. You could just take one. Sure. Great. Um, any uh, nominations for vice chair? I'd, I'd like to nominate uh, Commissioner Mari Bidu. Any other nominations? All right, we have a nomination of me, Deborah Lockwood for chair and Commissioner uh, Mari Bidu for vice chair. And may we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Fry. I'm in favor of that. Commissioner McClendon. Uh, yes to both. Commissioner Milliman? Yes to both. Commissioner Mori Bidu? Yes. Commissioner Monte Blanco? Yes. Commissioner Whips? Yes. Chair Lockwood? Yes. Looks like we have seven in favor. Great. Thank you. So thank you all, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Mori Bidu for stepping into that role and let's all have a good year together. And I think we are, we're ready to adjourn. So without objection, we are adjourned.